Welcome to our Monday Night Memories. What a great program Nate Barrett has helped us put together with our friends at TwinCitySuperstore.com, the Chariot, Chariot Auto Group. And uh, are we have a very, very special guest today. We, we do every month, but these are extra special with John Sauter and Jack Carl. If you go to Mackey Arena and go to Purdue basketball games, you've seen these guys, the ultimate behind the scenes guys, as being uh, hosts of uh, Purdue, Purdue visiting teams in, in, in Mackey Arena over the years. John's still doing it. Jack is, is in, in emeritus status uh, with respect to having done it, but some great stories, certainly. Uh, welcome to your to the media highlight of your career, Monday Night Memories. And uh, I'll start with you, Jack. You've actually retired from this, but this the, the fact that you know you both are great Purdue people, and Purdue has meant a lot to you, and from a professional standpoint. But kind of the, the, the my question is just the Purdue way of doing things, the way that Purdue, in in the way you've carried that off in terms of how important it is to host folks do the things the right way even though they're that dreaded opponent uh how you've treated guys over the years has been an important part of this and jack i'll start with you and john you can follow up okay well uh actually i started it as an usher in right. Lake field house and i did that for a few years and then i hosted the visiting team for several years and then when i decided Tony Anarino asked me if I would be interested in hosting the officials. And I said, oh, I thought that that would be fun. So I went, had a meeting with Red Mackey yeah. just to talk about what my responsibilities would be and how I should approach it. And he just said to be polite, be on time, and don't get involved in any discussions with the officials and <laughs> it'll be fine. <laughs> And I did that for 53 years. Yeah. And I still sub occasionally, but <clears throat> not very often. I'm going to follow up just Jack with you because, you know, Purdue fans tend to know officials by name. Uh, there have been some famous ones over the year, the Charlie Foudies of the world and all that. What, what, you know, when you, when you've dealt with officials, how, uh, uh, you, you know the good ones from the bad ones, maybe, or the ones that aren't as quite as good. But uh, is there a personality that they all bring to the table, that some bring to the table, that, that makes them really uh, translates to what they are on the court? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, my approach is I contact them by letter, ahead yeah. of time, and they appreciate that to know where the, to park, get the tickets, and all of that. But um, they, 90% of them are really top notch. And there's yeah. a few that you just don't welcome to Mackey. Yeah. And, you know, the coaches have a chance to rate them as well. And uh, if some of them are not quite up to par, according to the coach, then they don't come back. Yeah. Yeah. John, what about, you know, I, I was from a team standpoint, you know, you've, uh, uh, seen some unbelievable names come through here from Bob Knight, Mike Krzyzewski, Tom Izzo, but uh, that common thread of guys that, and the way that uh, Purdue wants to treat its guests, but also the opponent when they come into Mackey Arena. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a young pup compared yeah. to here. I've, I've only been doing it 41 years. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, there's been a, quite a few of the personalities that you just mentioned. Uh, generally, as a division one coach, uh, most of these guys have a pretty good sense of humor. Yeah. You know, uh, they didn't get there by accident and uh, by being jerks all the time and that sort of thing. And so uh, generally you kind of know what to expect. Some, you never quite know what to expect. You know, uh, Bob Knight's a great example, you know, uh, depending on when we played them and what was going on in the season, you never quite knew what was coming in. My hands were sweating on those nights when he showed up uh, just to see what the personality was going to be. But, you know, yeah, they're all just great guys. In fact, uh, the Bob Knight, Gene Cady days, uh, those were the greatest. Yeah. You know? And uh, so I've had a great opportunity to meet a lot of these guys, and I look forward to, to more years to come. Yeah. Jack, uh, we were talking before we started recording. I said I was going to throw some names out at you from my, my growing up years, so uh, of course, Ted Valentine still officiating, but Tommy Rucker and uh, uh, 
Jim Burr and Steve Wellmer are some of the names that I, you know, grew up, uh, Jody Sylvester, seeing at Mackey <laughs> Arena, maybe, maybe <laughs> share what you might be able to, Jack, what you'd feel comfortable for public consumption about some of those guys, what they were like to interact with. Well, one question first is something on my screen here. I don't know if I'm supposed to touch it or not. No, keep going. You're good. You're Everything good. Okay. Going, going fine. <laughs> well, uh, Valentine, he was something else. In fact, uh, his first games as an official was at Mackey. And he told me many years later that he was scared to death of Gene Cady. <laughs> what to expect from him? And, and uh, I said, well, Ted, you've done well all these years. And uh, I think the Mackey crowd knows who you are and they welcome you with open arms every time you can. And Terry Weimer is another one that uh, I thought was uh, a classy guy. And uh, he of course has left the Big 10 and he now officiates in the, a couple of other leagues and uh, um, trying to think of some others. Oh, Ed Hightower. How about Ed Hightower? Yeah. Yeah. Ed was terrific. Uh, he, he always arrived early. Yeah. Never, never demanded too much. And, uh, after the games was always polite and thanks everybody on his way out. And, uh, just one of the top officials in the conference. You know, Jack, one, one thing I was going to get, on the other side of that though, is they, these guys all have day jobs. I mean, they have, they're very accomplished professionals, uh, all kinds of what, what, what are some of the, if you were, recall some of the interesting jobs that these guys held? I mean, I know that there, it was in Gary Muncy was a ring salesman for Balfour for years, uh, as I remember. Uh, but tell me about some of the other ones that might've been different, uh, different types of uh, avocations uh, or uh, vocations, I should say, uh, in addition to being a college basketball official. Well, I really didn't uh, ask too many questions about what their personal life was like. I sort of let that say sure. burner. Uh, but some of my, like, uh, um, I'm trying to think of some that. Uh, that I, I, jobs that I'm, that some were superintendent. I know that uh, I know that uh, superintendents of schools. I mean, guys are. Yeah. The point being, they're they're accomplished into individuals, well off the I mean, off the basketball court. You have to be to be a to be a college basketball official to be able to withstand what it takes to do a good job there. Right. Um, yeah, Alan, I got a superintendent of school story actually. Ed yeah. Hightower. Yeah. Was the superintendent of Edwardsville, Illinois? Turns out I grew up in Highland, Illinois. Yeah. Fifteen miles from Edwardsville. And so they were always our arch rival back in the day. So every time they would show up, I would always say, Ed, the Highland Bulldog welcomes the Edwardsville Tiger. I hope you have a good game. Yeah. <laughs> I always thought that maybe gave us an edge just a little bit. Yeah. All that probably is important for that, uh, that winning percentage in Mackey. Nate, go ahead. I'm, I'm, John, I was going to ask you, uh, I heard a recent talk you gave, and I thought one of your better stories was to take us into a, a visit that you had when the, the Russian national team visited Mackey Arena and, and a little extra duty that you had that night. I think folks would enjoy hearing about that. Yeah, this goes back to the early 90s, I believe, when when the, uh, the, the Soviets, they used to have a touring team. Yeah. You know, they made a lot of money back in those days by playing seven games in eight days and that sort of thing. A big, big individuals, big people, human beings and that sort of thing. And so we were part of that circuit and it was always interesting. Uh, first of all, I have an interpreter with me. Yeah. Zina Brzezinski. I still remember yeah. Zina being with me because, you know, they're going to arrive and they have somebody from the state department with them. And, and so it gets your attention. And so the situation is that we're waiting for the teams to arrive. Typically they arrive an hour and a half before the game, but hour and a half teams, not there an hour and 15 minutes. They're not there an hour before the game, not there 45 minutes. Not there. We're approaching a half an hour before the game, and in they come. Flurry of activity, of course, getting them to the locker room, all through interpreters, trying to figure out what they need, where the floor is, all the basics. And uh, one of the coaches comes out and through the interpreter tells me that one of their players forgot their uniform 
back in the union building. Uh, could I take the player back there and get his uniform? Here it is now, 25 minutes before the game. So I said, I'm probably sure I can, can take the player with me. I'll just find a police officer and we'll just get through all this traffic. Well, they couldn't spare a police officer. So I said, can I take him in my car? And they said, sure, go ahead. So we walk out, get in my car and we're driving to the union. I have this big seven, four guy cramped up in the yeah. front seat of my car and trying to calm him down and make him feel all right. And so I just say, you know, uh, hope things are going okay. Uh, are you having a, a good tour? He looks at me and says, uh, USA, very good. Russia, very bad. Said, oh, <laughs> oh my God, he wants to defect. You know, now what am I, I going to do? But uh, I get him to the union. He goes up, gets his uniform, and we get back, and, and it all worked out just fine. I was going to say, you had some big names. Sabonis played here, some guys that were big time NBA guys from the yeah. Soviet Union at the time. Uh, you, could have, out. Yeah. you could have cut yourself a little deal there, John, and made a little, <laughs> a little bit. 15% of that might have might have been a good good deal. You could have gotten in the agency business in a hurry. That was plenty days. close for me. Yeah. <laughs> Jack, when you look at at, at at officials, and obviously Mackey Arena is never, uh, the fan base is never uh, shy in terms of expressing opinion. And knowing you professionally and how you, you know, you, you, you know, your, your job is to host and not, as you've said here already, not, not to, not to get into these guys personal life, but make it easy as it can. But any situations, you know, in terms of end of games or things that ended in a certain way that made it even extra difficult that you recall or extra challenging dealing with officials or getting them in and out of Mackey Arena? Was that ever a case in your in your situation? Yeah, the only game that was uh, a wild one was against Iowa. And yeah. uh, Bill Olson was the coach. And uh, Purdue won at the end of the game. And... Uh, John and I are always in the tunnel at the last time out of the game. So we're, I'm waiting there and John wasn't working at that time. I don't think he might have was, uh, but anyway, the, and the officials have two university police uh, as security. And when that game ended, they ran off the court, tried to protect the officials. And uh, Luke Olson and several players came by and tried to break into the officials' locker room, and they wouldn't have it. It was just wild. Just one of the never seen that before. You know, Jack. I think the game you're talking about we got me at my trip to New York as a high school as a college senior because that was the game the fa the famous Jim Bame Phantom Kevin Boyle call. Yes, that, it was. The, the, the Iowa fans will have forever say that never got called. And you're right, Lute Olson went nuts. I was fine with it because it probably was a phantom call, but Purdue delivered. Dan Palombizio had to hit a free throw and at the end, and Purdue won the game, won the next yeah. three games, and I got to go to New York. So thank you for anything <laughs> you had to do with that, Jack. Uh, uh, that was a big deal for me uh, yeah. on a personal level. So uh, th that's a great story. But, yeah, that's uh, – I don't envy those guys in any way, shape, or form in terms of how uh, – how that Mackey Arena crowd gets after them. Nate, go fire, fire away, my friend. Uh, John, uh, another good one you you mentioned uh, recently was Bill Frieder had some interesting habits when he got to Mackey Arena. I wonder if you would, would share with folks uh, what Coach Frieder would do when he would arrive at Mackey. Sure, I, I have a talk that I give that Nate heard, and I talked about coaching superstitions. Yeah. And, uh, basically routines. And Bill Frieder, you know, for whatever reason, they would show up go to the locker room, but Bill would, of course, put a towel over his shoulder and walk up to the very top row of Mackey Arena and just sit there for about 10 minutes. Of course, the arena's not open, nobody in it. He just kind of goes up there and meditates for about 10 minutes, kind of get his game face on. If anybody wants Coach Frieder, he's right up there. <laughs> but, but he would come down and we'd go from there. That was just his routine. <laughs> I can add... Go ahead. I can add to your Bill Frieder story. Uh, we used to go to the Gene Cady golf outing out in Vegas every year. Yeah. And uh, one year we were walking through the casino and who should we run into but Bill Frieder. Yeah. 
He's a card counter, card counter right? Didn't they? Didn't oh, they, yeah. they, they said that he yeah. could. They booted him out of Vegas because he was a, a guy that could win. Could could win big. Yeah. There are so many, you know, the Judd Heathcotes of the world who I think could have made had a career in stand up comedy. Uh, <laughs> the guys that, and I, and I'm not to ask you either to speak out of school, but guys that might have been a personality. And, and Judd seemed to be a great guy. You know, Dean Katie had a great affinity for him. Anybody out there that was a, oh, a sunshine and roses guy on the surface, but was a real pain to deal with. And uh, were there cases of guys that were Jekyll and Hyde folks outside of Bob Knight? You've already talked about that. But whether it be an official or a, a uh, coach or a team personality, any, anybody that comes to mind that uh, wasn't exactly what the, per, the, the, uh, the, uh, the public saw. John, I'll start with you. Well, a couple come to mind. One is Bill Cofield when he was with Wisconsin. Yeah. yeah. Not the nicest guy to have to deal with. Yeah. Um, he was obviously headed, he wanted to be a, work in the NBA. And this is just a short stop for him. And so he didn't have much time for anybody, you know. So we did not look forward to him. Uh, the other quirky, I suppose, personality was, uh, was Kevin O'Neill. Yeah. When he coached for Northwestern. Uh, he had a limited vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, most of it involved four letters <laughs> in every part of speech you can imagine. And that got old very quickly. I think he was only there maybe two years or so. Yeah, I think that's and, right. And might have moved on. So those two come to mind right off the bat. <laughs> you know, it's funny, uh, you guys, that uh, the, the one time I met Kirk Herbstreet, uh, when I was working in the SID office in college at Purdue, we used to get the privilege of working at the Big Ten tournament. And uh, Brian Remsburg, a guy that worked with me in the SID office, he and I sat behind the Northwestern bench under Kevin O'Neill. And Kirk Herbstreet was there right when he was starting to get famous. And we kind of made small talk, asked him what he was doing there. And he said, I'm just here to watch Kevin O'Neill. Yeah. <laughs> to hear all the language. But uh, Jack, I was going to ask, was there anything in the setup that re certain referees wanted in terms of their locker room or things they wanted to have? And then kind of the same to you, Jack, of anything set up wise that, that a, a, the teams or coaches or referees wanted a certain way? I can't think of any uh, specifically. Uh, usually when they arrive, I, I ask them if they need anything and uh, they need to see a trainer or have, you know, an ankle wrapped or whatever. And, we take care of that, uh, but some of them, uh, they might want a cup of coffee. But that's, that's about it. They usually have their own, and of course, the, the locker room is stocked with beverages for them anyway. So not really, I don't have, didn't have many problems. And I think you, John, uh, I, what I'm trying to lead you into with that question, John, would be uh, back to Bob Knight maybe for a minute. I think there was a, wasn't there a moment when maybe a, a student or a heckler even tried to, to get to Coach Knight one time? You just want me to tell that story. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, the situation is the, the visitor's locker room used to be right across the hallway from the John Purdue booster room. Yeah. And the only thing separating the two was like a, a blackboard on wheels. Yeah. You know, now they have a big tarp and all this other sort of thing. And the John Purdue club's not there but it brought the boosters within 20 feet of the locker room, which was yeah. never good to begin with. <laughs> and so, uh, so this particular game, uh, played the game and at halftime as we're coming out to the locker room, um, there's a young high school student who sticks his head around the corner and says, nice stomach, Bobby. <laughs> and Bobby chase, starts chasing the high school kid. So we're chasing Bobby Knight. Bobby Knight is chasing the high school kid in the court concourse under Mackey Arena. <laughs> and fortunately, the high school student is faster than any of us. And so nothing happened out of that. Uh, <laughs> but the punchline is that that young high school student is Randy Truitt. Ah! <laughs> Representatives. <laughs> now it could be told. Would have been a, that doesn't shock me. So at all. <laughs> Does it? <laughs> no, that's a great, that's a great story. Well, well, Randy, you'll get five minutes of rebuttal time. Uh, on our I, I, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> you know, Jack, you've been going to Mackey Arena, ga games in Mackey Arena since it opened. I don't know if you were there in the, uh, for the, uh, when John Wooden and UCLA yes. for the great dedication, but 
talk about some of those memories and just that the facility and, and, and what it means. And maybe, I don't know. And did, did you have, were you working that day? Were you an usher that day, as you recall, or were yes. you just stand? Yeah, I was hosting the officials. I don't remember who they were. Yeah. But, but uh, I do remember that I didn't have a seat. I had to sit in the aisle. Yeah. At that time, they hadn't made arrangements for uh, the host like John and myself or anyone else behind either bench. So it uh, it was exciting, though. That was a heck of a ball game. Just and uh, a, a great win for UCLA, but a tough loss for the Boilers. Yeah, and that and the, and when you look at the games over the years, Indiana obviously the games, the Bob nineteen Katie games, when the fans would be there forty five minutes before uh, the start of the games. But there have been some you know magical matchups over the years, but. Uh, Outside of Indiana, any other ones, any other things that any other common threads or teams that Purdue played that uh, made officials have to be on their A game any, any more than usual, but uh, games that you recall that were ec extra special from that standpoint? Oh, gosh, there's so many. Yeah. So many and I can't keep them all together, you know. Um, right, I can't. Yeah, you know, you, you look at that, you know, even, you know, you think of all the great coaches and, and, and great officials, you know, the, the Lou Dolsons and the Lou Hensons and all the ones that, 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 that have been here for so, so long. And, uh, mm -hmm. John, you know, you, you, you had, uh, what kind of personality was Lou Henson like? I mean, what, 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 what did he bring? I mean, he seemed, again, to be one of those guys that was pretty somewhat happy-go-lucky unless he was in the room with Bob Knight. Yeah. Uh, but uh uh, to talk about that personality. And, and of course, Gene Cady had a close relationship with Lou Henson over the years as well, the head coach at University of Illinois. Yeah, yeah. Lou, was, Lou wasn't all that talkative. Yeah. You know, the Lou do, we never quite yeah. knew exactly the, the hue on his hair as he would show up. Always had his wife with him who yeah. generally brought her mink coat and wanted to make sure we had that secure. Of course, yeah. we did. But Lou ended up giving me probably the nicest compliment of any of the coaches his very last time there after the after the game he just talked to me about he's always appreciated coming to Purdue because Purdue is first class yeah with everything it does and it's guys like you that help make it yeah you know yeah. And, and so I still remember that comment you know, yeah. and on that comment John uh I think not everyone realizes that not every school has done what Purdue has done in right. terms of rolling out the red carpet for its guests. Maybe you could touch on that. Well, we at least have a familiar face. I'm not sure how much red carpet we roll yeah. out. Um, but the concept was, was to have uh, an adult host the, host the visiting teams as well as the officials. Um, a lot of times officials don't get hosted at all and visiting teams get hosted by the lowest on the totem pole freshman <laughs> manager. Yeah, mm -hmm. who generally meets them the, the day before for shooting practice, but that's about it. Uh, in most schools, they stay with a team while they're here, and it's not the most pleasant duty. And so it was an adult in both cases, and I think that's what they were trying to accomplish, and I clearly has accomplished that. Yeah, yeah those were practices that Red Mackey instituted. He wanted adults to take care of the team and the officials. Yeah. And that's been kind of a, a the standard, obviously, set to, uh, for a very long time because uh, it was something I think, it, like you said, Jack, very, very important to the way that uh, Purdue tried to do things. All right. Well, last question I'll have uh, in terms of weather in, in the middle of the winter can be crazy. You can have officials not show up. Ooh. I don't remember, Jack, uh, any time that that happened, but it probably did or any any kind of mishaps where you had to go scrambling to find an official or get an extra official. I know Terry Fogarty, I, uh, I think was always around to be able to do it if, ne if necessary, but tell me about uh, anything that you recall from that standpoint. And, and uh, then I'll let go to you, John, in terms of what effect that uh, weather or travel had to do with things from time to time. Yeah, there have been a few isolated cases. And uh, I think uh, in one case, we, they would start with just two officials until the third one arrived. And then at the halftime, they'd start with all three. Yeah. But there were very few cases when that happened. Those guys are pretty pretty resilient in getting over there. Any, any John, from you, any weather-related stories or things that uh, made it uh, from a host standpoint with from a team, you know, trying to make sure you got them taken care of? We, 
we've played through blizzards, we've played through those kinds of things, ice storms, et cetera, in yeah. Mackey Arena over the years, but anything that stands out from that perspective? Well, generally, it impacted teams more after the game. Yeah. Uh, the situation is that uh, the Big Ten has a contract with a charter air service, and this charter air service flies several teams. So they drop one off and they fly someplace else and pick up another team. Yeah. And so uh, if the weather is not what it should be, uh, sometimes they're rolling the dice and they're going to be late. And there's, there's been more than a few times where all of a sudden, you know, the, the plane's been delayed, the game's over, and they've got a three-hour wait. Well, where do you wait? On the bus or do you wait in the locker room? So you wait yeah. in the locker room. Yeah. And so then it's a tough call. Do I sit around for three yeah. hours? And uh, here again, quite a few of the coaches will come out and say, John, go home to your family. You don't have to wait. We're just fine. You know, yeah. um, so that's happened a few times. Sometimes they have to change their plans and go down to Indianapolis. Yeah. Because the uh, Purdue field, they couldn't get the runway lights on. That happened one time, you know, yeah. for example. Yeah. Uh, generally getting to the game, though, they by hook or crook, they're going to be there to the start of the game. It's yeah, after where you kind of roll the dice sometimes. Of course, the Big Ten has that rule, right? They have to be there the night before. Is, is that uh, typically the case? Is that I believe that's right. Out? And they regulate who can fly, who can drive, and all that other yep. sort of stuff. Yeah. Nate, time for, time for one more. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I just want to thank you both. And it, it's always a bright spot to, to, over the years, watch you guys get up at that final four-minute timeout and start to make it. <laughs> Make your move up the up the tunnel. We noticed that, yeah. Yeah, and then and the only other one that John I was thinking of, if Jack could comment as well, but maybe you remember <laughs> probably around 97, 98, I want to say with maybe Clem Haskins in Minnesota, there was some trouble uh, getting in here uh, uh, one time. Uh, maybe they even had to land an Indian bus up here. But Alan remembers it better than I do. But I remember there was an incident where things had to be adjusted. But thank you again. Sure, sure. I don't remember that particular one, but that has happened. And, and sometimes they can't charter a bus, and so they charter three vans or something, you know, yeah. and then they get lost on the way. Those kinds of things have happened. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was the one where Clem Haskins, and it might have been, uh, I'm a weather guy, so I think I remember it was a, like a, a 20 inch snowstorm. And Clem thought Indianapolis was West Lafayette. I mean, he's, <laughs> well, I, I'm local, I got here. Well, yeah. he didn't. They, they got, I think, Indianapolis, and I think they ended up making it up maybe a day later but uh, yeah. that game got postponed and and uh, i think or they actually changed it i think and Purdue played them in back-to-back -back games and yeah. uh, uh maybe 1999 that was but uh, yeah that was uh, uh always an interesting thing hey gentlemen uh, we appreciate your time so much and your expertise and all that you've meant to Purdue basketball over the years and and uh Jack, I'm always happy to see when you're pinch hitting in there. That's a that's always a good thing. And John, I, I we'll wish you another 41 more years of doing that. So, uh, but that'll be good. I think Matt Matt Painter's uh, Matt Painter may still be coaching at Purdue by that time. You never know. So, so. hey guys, thanks so much, and we appreciate uh, Nate. Uh, thank you as well, and for not only for your sponsorship, but we always enjoy the show. A lot of fun to do. Monday night memories. Uh, the one thing good guys about that internet thing is this is here from now till the end of time. So yeah, uh, it'll, it'll live on and we'll, we'll have it on our site to, and uh, our readers and listeners uh, will be very happy to, to, to digest it to hear. You want to hear one more story? Yeah, go ahead. Always Gene good. Story last well, go ahead. Gene, I, Gene Steratore was one yeah. of my favorites because he was typical Italian, you know? Yeah. But uh, when I found out that he was going to be officiating as umpire of his last uh, NFL game, I sent him an email. I said, now, Gene, remember, when the offensive lineman, I mean, the defensive lineman crosses the line, it's offside, not traveling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he sent me an email back. He said, Jack, thanks for the reminder. I'll try and remember that. <laughs> yeah, and, and now Gene's got his got himself a television career as well. And yep, uh, yes, what a great yes. uh, what a great official over the years. Well, he does a great job of yeah. teaching. I think, guys, thanks again. We'll uh, we'll uh, bring this show to a close and uh, have a great uh, rest of your week. And we'll look forward to our our June issue June edition of Monday Night Memories. Nate and I will come up with something really fantastic. Maybe not as good as this, but it'll be fantastic. <laughs> All right, guys, have a great thanks, week. Guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you both. Enjoyed it. Bye -bye. John.